So I was at the hospital um, a few weks ago getting my rohypsumab because I have lupus. And mm -hmm. um, it was one of the auxiliary um, nurses. So the people that kind of do like the cleaning and the housekeeping parts of it. And yeah. this guy was like, that, um, you want a sandwich and some soup? And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be great. Thanks. I said, but can I, I don't want egg or tuna, if that's OK. And he went, well, we don't know what you can get because it's just what's ever is available. And, you know, that way I know that this was like, I know this was a, a microaggression because it was like, how dare I want to have a choice or assert yeah. myself, you know, and that's not always allowed. So, yeah. and yeah, that's no, exactly I, what it is. Yeah. Like, yeah, like I had, um, I was at Ikea, you know, and I, you know, I was trying to order and, and this woman looked offended that I was trying to order food, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so she gave me like this much and I was just like, you know, no. mm -hmm. can I get a bit more? And oh, the look on her face, it was like, <laughs> yeah, how you dare know, you know, like, how dare you ask for more? Like, yeah. you know, but well, the you're people all beside twist. me who were all, yeah, who were not black, right? They all yeah. got loads of food. <laughs> and, you know, but then they get offended when yeah. you, you actually, how dare you ask? How dare you feel like mm -hmm. you're a human? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Why are you so confident? Why are you smiling? Why are you even yeah. enjoying your day? Do you know, yeah. how dare you? Like, yeah. um, and then you come over here eating her, like, ham sandwiches oh, girl let me tell you so so I'm a stay-at-home mom right uh -huh. and um you know I thought that I'm starting to become friends with this particular woman uh -huh. and she was really upset that I was a stay-at-home mom oh, and no. I wasn't on benefits yeah and what? um anyway and then she went and told someone else that these you know all the good white men are taken by these foreign oh my women god i'm embarrassed for her <laughs> it's just what yeah. by these oh. foreign women they go in and they get these women from and she was acting like she was my friend and i couldn't get that mm -hmm. and for her like how dare i you know mm -hmm have a better better life than her I don't think I have a better life you know because she has a lovely house and whatever mm -hmm. um like massive house and um but she was bothered she was bothered yeah. that my husband can provide for me and our three kids um you know yeah yeah and it's just madness and do you think that's the other thing as well like you know that this if this was her mate Becky there'd be no worry about that but the fact is yeah. that do you know well you should be you should be scrubbing toilets or something do you know yeah. it's that kind of yeah. a mentality yeah. that yeah. you should be struggling because yeah, yeah she does know that there's a power imbalance she does know that in society yeah. we are more likely to be doing that yeah. kind of thing yeah so why aren't you yeah. you know and it's like well you get it's like you're in the same social standing as I am yeah how dare but, you oh how dare you uh -huh, yeah dare Oh yeah. yeah, definitely. And you know, and I recognize my privilege in that, you know, that I'm able to be with my kids. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's a big thing. But I would love that for every mother. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. Um, I wouldn't be trying to be like to mm -hmm. bad mouth them. And, no. Yeah. Anyway, let's get started. Um, yes. Hi everyone. <laughs> this Hello. is Charlene and hi. I'm Maureen. I so I started podcasting two years ago after the death mm -hmm. of George Floyd mm -hmm. um, and I started by just sharing my experience with racism in Ireland and then I invited a few people um, I had a doctor who talked to us about breastfeeding in in mm -hmm. black families and you know different people come on um, but and I used to call it rant and pray but I've done a lot of deconstructing and um I don't know what the so I don't want to call it rant and pray not because I don't pray anymore I do still mm -hmm. pray but I also don't want to you know because I think the work is bigger yeah. than you know than yeah you know what I anticipated so I don't have a name for this podcast now um, <laughs> rant and racism. Gonna, 
<laughs> yeah, fighting racism. Um, but I really <laughs> want to highlight the experiences of black and brown mm-hmm. women um, in Ireland and the UK, other places as well. But I really, yeah. really want to highlight our experiences because um, mm-hmm. we are a demographic that is often overlooked. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we don't have a lot of voices um, speaking out. So um, I will come up with a name eventually. Yeah. You come <laughs> up with that anyway. Welcome to <laughs> this thank you, podcast thank you. and Yay. this video chat. Um, if you're watching this, you're probably watching on YouTube. We'll have some clips on TikTok as well. And yeah. I will have it up on, um, you know, Spotify and that kind of thing as well. Um, so yeah welcome Charlie. thank you thank you for having me and you know it is really good to kind of uh share my experience as well because it's slightly it's different we're still in celtic parts of the uk so yeah. i'm in glasgow um yeah. but you know my mum was born here and yeah. i suppose her experience especially coming from a really diverse you know her my grandfather was mixed race my grandmother was white And my grandfather's dad was black, African-American, and his Mm. wife was um, white Scottish. So there's that kind of a mix that's been throughout the family. So when people are asking me where my roots are, they're Scottish. Yeah, Yeah, and Scotland. Yeah. In Scotland. Um, And obviously my dad is African-American or he was African-American. So, but having not had any contact, not until the latter part of his life really um then no I, I identify as black scottish so it's very yeah. different yeah. yeah people are often surprised when they hear my accent and look yeah. at my face they're like where yeah. where did that come from yeah when you just think <laughs> oh god yeah exactly I especially, love cause, it. especially because i'm dating and things like that so they're like that oh <laughs> exotic lady yeah. and i'm like that yeah, yeah. aye that's right <laughs> Like, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> so, have you ever been told go back to your country? Oh yeah, yeah, loads of times. Uh huh. How did yeah. that make you feel? I was confused when I was younger. I was yeah. really confused because I'm like that. What yeah. country? Did they mean what? What, what do they mean? Do they mean America or did they mean, yeah. you know? And I was like, Mum was always born in Glasgow. And she's like, Yeah, you were born here. And I was like, Right. So I didn't know. I, I I couldn't think where that would be. I knew yeah. it was to do with because there was other people who were brown but had different accents growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Um so now when people say that I will often use like um where where should I go if I'm born in Glasgow and and they're like, well uh, and they're stuttering because I'm like, yep, oops. And you know, and yeah that's a hard one and I feel like Mm -hmm. sometimes when people say you know go back to your country sometimes it doesn't bother me because you know mostly bred in Kenya and I always think you know I don't really have a piece of land but I could access (laughs) I'm sure the Kenyan government would give me some I don't know but you know I but but you've lived here your entire life your children are here your husband is here this is your home you pay taxes here so yeah. this is where this is your house this is your house yeah. this is your home this is my so. home. <laughs> yeah yeah no sometimes I get really offended and then other times I think oh well you know whatever but yeah. I can't imagine if your roots if like you're born mm-hmm. you're bred like mm-hmm. you're from Scotland your mom is from Scotland like <laughs> when people say that it's just like you know yeah well I think it also oh, excuse me I'm just getting trapped I think it also I highlight just how stupid they are you know because it's like well where do I go yeah what, do you know the first street I lived in or what, what does that what does, what do you mean by that, <laughs> you know? that so, yeah why not yeah what, absolutely what, what where should I go if I'm born in Glasgow uh, my, my mum was born in Glasgow my grandparents were born in Glasgow where should I go back to what street yeah. are you wanting a specific street or what happens from that <laughs> I love your cheek I yeah. love your cheek because it's just such a ridiculous comment yeah. and regardless of whether or not somebody was born here or not if they are contributing positively to society what's the problem what's the problem yeah like, it's it's just it's, my my skin color offends you that much yeah and I think that's a question that I'll be asking next yeah. is it because of yeah. 
is it because I'm brown and is that really upsetting you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, because that's exactly what it is. Because that's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes you've done nothing, you've said nothing to these people and they just walk up to you and say that. Like, it's, yeah. So tell me, um, do you remember the first time you experienced racism? I do. Um, So I remember, I'm going back to when I was about, I was in nursery and I remember a kid saying something like, you're a black darky. That was the the comment. And I was like, I didn't know what that was, but I went and spoke to the nursery teacher and mm. it was something horrible and mean. Yeah. And I can't remember what the nursery teacher's um, response to that was. Um, yeah. I don't think it was very positive because then I remember my mum, um, when I told my mum about it, and yeah. she was like, you know, I can just remember her face angry and challenging to that nursery teacher about well what did you do about that and and everything else so that Mm -hmm. was the first time that I remember something like that but I think it was primary school where it really set in about you know how different I was because I was taller than everybody else you know um my hair was different from everybody else's and yeah that's when I really at first noticed it is primary school that's so young yeah like you know it's so so young like Mm -hmm. have somebody attack something that you have no control over no control over it none none of us you know say okay give me this amount of melanin or don't give me any melanin (laughs) at all (laughs) that's the only difference it's our pigmentation and people attack you and for me for a child as young as four because nursery is about three or four and for a child to even know what a what a black dark is Uh black dark is like yeah they have learned that it has to be the parent absolutely and I think then when I went to primary school um I remember being very very you know looking out for other people who look like me Yeah. And I think for the entire seven years that I was in primary school, there was maybe only three other people that mm-hmm. I remember seeing yeah. that way. So all of primary, um, I didn't have anyone in my class that looked like me ever. And I remember yeah. there was a few older um, children. Um, I think they were an Asian family and they were in the, the same school. Yeah. And in the area that I lived in, <clears throat> there was another girl called Charlene, funnily mm-hmm. enough. And... Um, again, like whenever we seen each other, it was like, like away from the distance. <laughs> yeah, just a bit like away. Oh <laughs> yes. uh-huh. um, and <clears throat> in high school, I remember writing about that as well, and it was used as a, an example of past papers for um, creative writing because it was like I described all the feelings and and everything else. It was just like it was like one of my first day of school, and yeah. you know, and describing how when somebody pointed out the skin colour difference and how and how suddenly that changed my absolute perception of everything and with this exciting fun starting of school and then suddenly it was like well no you can't you're not starting because you're different and I think that's that's it fundamentally and when we're talking about racism and when that first hits it's like a kick in the gut and it doesn't necessarily go away you know because we can't change it and so I was going to ask you, like, what what have been the effects of racism for you in your life, having experienced racism from such a young age? The negative parts is I think that from a young age, um, one of the things my grand did, and I think this is quite a Scottish thing, was like, don't you let anybody speak to you like that you're bigger and better than everybody else. You make sure you butter her right across the face, right? So it was violence initially. Um, And someday that that wasn't part of who I was. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it was a real struggle, but because I was subjected to violence from other kids, then I did lash out. And being taller, stronger meant that then I was winning. Um, So then it changed it a bit. They changed the dynamic. Um, But it also meant that I learned ways of humour yeah. and again being challenging 
by being directly honest and just confronting it head on yeah. I find that that kind of stops people from being able to go to you know to to have that power to an extent yeah so I think that's what I've been using for the majority of the time is a lot of yeah. humor um and just being direct you know and yeah. I think there was a lot of things like um and it's opened up good discussions as well to be fair so things yeah. like I remember doing a training um and it was with foster carers and a foster carer said oh listen hen you're no you're not really black you're you're you know like a brownie color and I was like look you're no white you're peachy paley pink but we're not getting specifics it's about a sense of identity and yeah. this is how I identify yeah. and so we all laughed at that because it was just you yeah. know that's the ridiculousness of you know how somebody else is trying to define what I should describe myself as and I'm like no you don't get to decide that you know that these are there's categories in that for comfort there's categories in that just for our sense of identity and so that we're not called the n-word so that we're not called anything else and it's taken that power back so this is how I describe myself um as the years went on I think and as your confidence grows and everything else um it's really it defines you as in that I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of where I've came from. I'm, I know that this has shaped me. It's created a lot of trauma. It's created a lot of humour. Um, yeah. It's created a lot of compassion and empathy for others, especially mm-hmm. for marginalised groups, because mm-hmm. I don't want anyone to feel less than. Yeah. Nobody should yeah. have to feel that way. So yeah. I think it's made sure that I've um, been a, a good person or a decent human. Um, yeah. It's made me quite... Um, aggressive when I have to be because yeah. I'm often the person that's on, on the attack um, yeah. so yeah it's a mixture of all of it yeah what about has, um, oh god so I internalised everything mm-hmm. so I, I only fought once mm-hmm. and, and I only and it was because I was defending a cousin of mine yeah. um, but any other time when somebody attacked me, called me the N word, like whatever, I just took it. I took it, mm-hmm. didn't say anything, and I just internalized it. Didn't have, I didn't have an outlet for it as well. Yeah. Um, my home wasn't very safe to like, you know, like my parents didn't quite get racism, you know, and I get it. They moved to Ireland in their 30s and 40s, you know, yeah. and yeah. so they knew who they were. They knew they were Kenyan, they knew they had yeah. come to Europe for you know for a better life and, yeah and for them it meant putting up with whatever came you mm-hmm. know I came at such a vulnerable age um where I didn't quite know who I was you know as well yeah. because I hadn't I never met my dad I never really lived with my mom the first time mm-hmm. I lived with my I was 12 years old she had a whole new family you know oh, so I'm trying, like, really difficult navigate all of that and navigate mm-hmm in a new country um, and a new way of doing things so I just I put it in and I stuffed mm-hmm. my food um, yeah. <laughs> so, yes Same. Um, so, and, I, and then I questioned my my identity like there was a lot of you know I never felt like bleaching my skin uh-huh. but yeah understood why people do, did it and then I always made sure not to have my hair out so my hair was always in braids and then mm-hmm. when I started to kind of put do weaves my hair was always in weaves my mm-hmm. face plastered with makeup and I know I'm wearing makeup today but um I like most days I don't I couldn't care less <laughs> I'm just like oh whatever <laughs> <laughs> Now I, I love my skin, like my skin. Oh, just it's gorgeous. Grows. Like, you know, I've learned mm-hmm. to embrace it for a long time from mm-hmm. about the age of 15, like my, for until I was about 21, literally couldn't leave my house without makeup, like, um, because I just felt like if I could only make myself look better, maybe I wouldn't get yeah. called the word. And um, if I didn't show my Afro, then, you know, then mm-hmm. nobody's going to make fun of me, you know? Um, yeah. So it, affected my identity but not just racism I think that stemmed from not having a good attachment with my parents as well and then the racism just really mm-hmm. made, you know worse mm-hmm. and then I struggled with, with mental health issues for a long time I felt very mm-hmm. depressed and anxious and I still do um yeah. you no 
so like a group of teenagers um mm -hmm. white teenagers i i cross the road oftentimes yeah. um because as a as a teenage girl i i went through a lot and you know mm -hmm. so yeah so yeah but i internalized a lot of it i i didn't have an outlet and i didn't have somebody being like okay you're gonna fight them you're strong you're you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <just> like, <clears throat> I'm the problem you know I think I think that's the thing like there is a lots of I mean that was in primary school secondary school was a whole other kettle of fish because that's different yeah. um, and I was lucky enough that my mum had said to me you know Charlene you're black um you're a woman and you have huge boobs the last thing you need is to go to a, um, a co-ed school so I went to an old girls school for high school yeah. Yeah. so I went to an old girls catholic school and I think at that school, it was so beneficial because there was girls all over Glasgow that came. Yeah. So it opened it up to finding out more about different cultures, diff seeing other people who look like me, seeing people who, um, you know, had a mixture of different families. So that yeah. really helped um, oh, in terms of embracing who I was. However, you still have that identity crisis because you are trying to conform to that beauty standard of straight hair and all of that and I do not have the skill set or the ability to do my own hair and my mum never had to do although she had afro hair her hair was a lot more manageable than mine yeah. so um, she had the advantage of having um, a mixture of her hair and in the 70s they could do the, the, the large afro and everything else and look stunning um, yeah. and then even in the 80s and 90s she was still able to manage her hair but we couldn't do mine and so not having that sense of family where you can learn how to do the different hairstyles and things was a real yeah. struggle for me yeah. um, and that's where the bit where I think my hair part of it I really struggled in terms of feeling pretty because I didn't have the flowing hair I didn't know what to do with my hair and the majority of my high school in fact from about 13 onwards was hit in a pony my hair was in a pony um, yeah. and my mum tried to do her best to send me to hairdressers and stuff to get it this way or that way but yeah I just I suppose I didn't feel um comfortable or pretty for a long yeah. time do you know yeah. Um, so yeah and honestly hair hair and you know what even to this day yeah. Hair is the one thing and yeah. And it's always sadly, it's always white women. Some white man will say something, you know, like my father-in-law, mm -hmm. I told you, you know, mm -hmm. um in a different conversation that he would be like, "Haha, did you get electrocuted?" But white women always feel the need to talk about our hair. Mhm. Mm and my mother-in-law did it for so long. And one of the, one time I called her from America, right? I'm the one making the effort to call her, not her son, okay? <laughs> so I was like, oh, let's call your parents. So I call her and I have Elijah. We just had the one at the time. And, you know, as soon as she came on, she was um, doing her hair. She was mm -hmm. wearing her hair. And, you know, she was like, ha, 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 don't mind me today. My hair is as messy as your hair. Honestly, and yeah. Laughed. And literally, I was standing there on camera being like, and then I just laughed it off because I was like, I don't know what else to do, right? Yeah. Um, but literally, like, it was always a topic of conversation. And it was always like, you know, like if I had... Um, so I plait when my hair is out, I plait it to go to sleep mm -hmm. and, you know, take it out the next day so that the curls are more defined and whatever. Yeah. So it happened, if I happened to be at her house or she, or she was at mine before I had, you know, taken out my mm -hmm. hair to, to let it out and she'd be like, are you, are you, why, why are you undoing it? Just let it stay like that. Because um, for her, mm -hmm. the Afro being big, you know, is a bad thing and it's messy yeah. and it's the same with a lot of white women the amount of white women that I've seen at moms and tots who felt the need to like comment on my hair one of them was like oh that's what my hair looks like <laughs> when it's you know when it's when I haven't brushed it or yeah or when it, and I was just like who asked you yeah or when 
this is a big one. This is a big microaggression. Oh, your hair looks nice today. Yes. Yes, definitely. Like, nobody asked you. Yeah. Like, nobody asked you. Yeah. Nobody. Uh-huh. Oh, I like your hair when it's really straight like that, you know. Oh, you can yeah. leave it like that. Like, I will do what As if I had I a choice. Uh-huh. Yeah, as if I have a choice that I could wear my hair whatever way. You know, it really just like, depends on the energy. Right. Yeah. Do you know how long it takes to straighten my hair? And how damaging. Yeah. You know, it is, you know, and that's why a lot of women ended up, you know, and even now there's still a huge, I thought because I became natural, right? <laughs> I mm-hmm. thought that all black women had become natural because a lot of, there was a movement in my church where just a lot of girls started, you know, yeah. going natural. So I thought that nobody does their hair, puts chemicals in their hair. A lot of people yeah. still do. Still do. Yeah, a lot of black women, and it's causing yep. us cancer and fibroids. But we would rather do that than have people talk about our hair yeah. all the time because that's how exhausting and painful it is. Absolutely, and I think a lot of that kind of a uh, um, insecurity I know I've taken on, um, yeah. and although I've said I've used humor, what I've done is a lot of self-deprecating things. So I would say things that you know, that I know that they would possibly say, you know, yes. like, oh, my hair's a mess, um, or, yes. like, there's me l- looking like Don King, because, you know, yes. because, you know, if it's you all that kind of... First, uh-huh. yeah, like, if I say it first, nobody else can hurt me. Yeah, and as yeah. much as it might be funny at the time, you know, part of me inside dies, because it, it is that kind of a, it's that internalised um, dislike and hatred yes. of, um, of your- a beauty standard that I cannot... I cannot yeah. obtain. I cannot yeah. obtain it. Yeah. And, and our hair is beautiful. Let me tell you, yeah. right? Oh, listen, for my husband, like the reason, one of the reasons I don't think I will ever divorce him. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, so when I started growing my hair, we mm-hmm. were just dating, right? So, but I wore it in braids and weaves for quite a bit. Yeah. And then one day I just knew I had to own my hair, right? Mm-hmm. So, I started wearing my hair out, but before I did, I called, I texted him and I was like, um, so I'm going to start wearing my hair out and I understand if you want to break up with me. Oh, no and- way. <laughs> I like, I understand if you want to date a white woman. <laughs> like, how crazy is that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so he texted me, he was like, Maureen, if I don't like your hair, then I don't like you because yeah. that's the way God made you. Oh. so for my wedding when his mom was like how are you gonna wear your hair and then my mom was like how are you gonna wear my hair because a lot of African people have a lot of internalized racism yeah and exactly yeah so I was like I'll just wear my hair <laughs> you know I was one of the first people within our group to kind of really own and wear the natural hair and um, so when everybody else is going crazy my husband was like why don't you leave it out mm-hmm. in an and put a flower in it because that's the way you love to wear it and I really love it like that (laughs) and that is so good to have a partner that's champion championing that you know and it's that's beautiful and that's how it should be but again it's like that internalized racism that we have ourselves Um, and that's where I think for the longest time I've only started wearing my hair in braids one because I'm too lazy to do anything else because I don't have to really think about it um, and I don't wash it that often and it's it's you know it's fine yeah. and it also gives me length and yeah. you know being yeah. able to whip my hair around which is things that I never <laughs> exactly which is things that I never really kind of I had growing up because it was always really you know stiff and, and kept back so yeah. I think that for me um, now as I'm older you know I I'm like that right now I'm going to and um, spend the money on getting my braids taken out putting in and all of that because it's just healthier and my hair is really really long now naturally yeah. Um, yeah. but I'm too terrified to do anything with it because I don't know what to do do you know because I still I know that I don't have the executive function to take the time out to spend hours doing it um so the braids are a safe option and a healthier yeah. option and it makes me feel more black or that helps me to identify you know with that that kind of a because it suits me so yeah Yeah. that's 
that's where I'm at now, but it's taken a long time to get to where I am now. Yeah. And it's, I think it's, um, it's a process of healing, right? Yeah. It, honestly, like embracing your hair and truly, mm-hmm. truly like embracing it, it comes as you heal. The more you heal from mm-hmm. racial trauma, even, and, and from whatever other trauma you might have, the more you mm-hmm. start to embrace yourself and, and hair becomes, yeah. you start to, oh, I, I quite like my hair. Yeah. And, um, but it is a lot of work, like you said. Um, but like my wash days are long, you know, because you know you dip condition. Yeah. I condition it before I shampoo it, right? Yeah. And then shampoo it, and then I deep condition it again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then I started over the last year or two blow drying it, which I didn't do before mm-hmm. because my hair has gotten longer. It's easier actually when it's blow dried. It's yeah. easier to wear it in a stretch state. Yeah. But then that that I have to use um I have to use um heat protector right yeah. so I really learned how to like blow dry my hair and sometimes straighten it without damaging it um yeah. you know and it, it's a lot of work but it comes as we heal and I think yeah. that's why we have seen this kind of movement of black women owning their hair um, yeah. and black hairstyles and whatever um it's, it's coming it's, because we're healing we're healing from yeah. our trauma and yeah. and we're saying you know whatever like you know we don't have to your standards whiteness and and misogyny and misogyny mm-hmm. does not have to define us we get to define who we are and if yeah. i want to afro i'm gonna wear my afro if i want to wear my braids i want to wear my braids if i want to wear a front lace wig i'm gonna wear it it. yeah and you know and that's healing for me and i think sometimes because sometimes we can go to the other end and be like okay and i did it where it's like it's just my natural hair and nothing else and you're not black enough if you're not you know (laughs) no 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 no. it's whatever suits you Uh every night (laughs) <laughs> it's whatever suits you do you know that's the thing like yeah it's it's too much energy and the thing is yeah. the other thing that I've done right which is another extreme if you like um yeah. so for years I've got a spending problem I really do I buy a lot of rubbish and I, bu- I buy a lot of clothes clothes that I don't wear yeah. but what yeah. I specifically buy is things that are worn by black plus size models yeah. <laughs> now, they're, they're, they're 19 years of age right yeah that not the same skin tone as me but yeah. my thinking is oh well it suits her so yeah. now so very <laughs> and sheen and all of those places will will advertise all the black models to me because they'll be like oh yeah. charlene will buy it do you know? yeah and you do, <laughs> I do. i'm like that oh yeah that's oh well that suits her like oh, she's gorgeous and that i'm going to wear that it doesn't wear you know that. yeah uh-huh. no, and it's like I, it's like I, um, yeah, I love, love, love that. Another thing that, you know, I love social media, right? For so uh-huh. many reasons. But for me, it's been like, it really helped me grow my hair, right? I was yeah. on YouTube all the time. I watched every video on black hair I could find. Mm-hmm. And this was, you know, 2011, that you know, mm-hmm. when I started out. So there weren't as many hair influences, right? And mm-hmm. so the movement of black fat girls owning mm-hmm. their body yes and I use fat in you know in a good way because we're reclaiming that word yeah but owning their bodies and and I was just like oh my god okay so I don't have to hide behind you know awful clothes I can nope. I, I can own it and I just love mm-hmm. love, love that we have that now and you know, I know people joke about it. They're like in twenty whatever, every like the summer body is gonna be like a fat body. Yeah. You know, and they say it as a joke. But you know what? I love that we're embracing that. And it's been so healing to be like, no, curves are okay, my yeah. lips are okay, and my hair is okay. Yes. See people that look like me owning it and just loving Absolutely. themselves. Absolutely. And I think I think that's part of the the difficulty when you know I suppose for you as a creator on TikTok or any on social media platforms and the amount of hate comments and everything else is because there is women that are ha- showing their intelligence, that are showing um, their skill set or, you know, their love of, or interest in certain things and yeah. bringing awareness to 
you know, the trauma that they've experienced or the racism yeah. they've experienced and doing it confidently. Yeah. And for a lot of bigoted people, they yeah. cannot cope with that. And yeah. that's where a lot of the comments are coming from. Yeah. You know, it's that jealousy, that that kind of a, what, who's, why are you saying I'm racist? I'm like, well, no, we're not. But if you're acting like that, then there yeah. has to be a kind of a deeper internalised um look at yourself as to why does it upset you so much that that yeah. person's talking about that why does it yeah. why would you have to feel the need to say well not everybody do you know yeah yeah oh, yeah yeah and, I, yeah. and I, yeah and I think we're just at a point like I reached a point where I thought I can't be quiet anymore like no. this is ridiculous and toxic systems just want good little girls who just comply and yeah, yeah no I'm just going around <laughs> setting things on fire being yes. like yeah. you, you know, this is racism you need to stop or this is sexism you need to stop this is child abuse you need to stop yeah. because I I was quiet I was such a good girl Charlene I yeah. never spoke against anybody I literally just fell in line and mm -hmm. and did what you know my caregivers wanted me to do what the church mm -hmm. wanted me to do and um, what racist people wanted me to do even yeah. I protected my father-in-law like, yeah for years never spoke up against him never and like and it ate me up the the consequences for that was I lost who I was yeah I didn't know who I was because I yeah. was just all things for all people so that people could like me so that I could be seen as a nice person and yeah. people still had nasty things to say like yeah. it doesn't matter how <laughs> do you know what I mean it doesn't it doesn't matter nice and you can be mm -hmm. a doormat and people can walk all over you and do whatever they want and they will still find something wrong with you so Absolutely. now I'm just like at a point where I'm like no I'm gonna call it out Mm -hmm. um if you don't like it you don't like it but I can no longer deny myself I think that's where I'm at now as well and I think in the workplace um I think that what I always thought was quirks um yeah. obviously is my neurodivergency yeah. and things like that as well so there's times when you know obviously I would speak thing I would say things out loud that was meant to be internal <laughs> it was meant yeah. to be internal but I've said it out loud um and so when there was discriminatory things happening, I don't know if you've watched this program called Black Ops. It's just on BBC iPlayer, no. and it's quite it's a comedy, and it's these um two under these two young cops, and at one point in it, they're asked for their badge of ID. Yeah, and the, the she's like, I work here, <laughs> and the cops like that. No, I've never seen you before, and she's like, Look, I'm on the poster. Well, that happened to me. That happened to me. I was working in a police station. And whenever I didn't wear my badge, I was the only person that was constantly singled out to say, well, where's your ID? Nobody else was ever asked that. And yeah. after I left that um, that police station, because after I left that police station and, and was moved to somewhere else, um, and I was highlighting that to management and everything else, so like, well, you should have wore your ID. Not recognising, again, not recognising that that is the microaggressions. You're yeah. not dealing with it or not wanting to deal with it as part of that. Um, and also, you know, for a, a long time, a running standing joke in our team meeting was we need value and diversity training to look at and to examine our prejudices and biases to make sure that the clients that we're working with, we're not absently yeah. um, contributing to their discrimination that we'll have. Um, because that's the thing about intersectionality. We know that, Although we're meant to all be equal, we're, some people are more equal than others. <laughs> you know, that's just how society works. And when you look at the race for life, you know, somebody who's in a wheelchair is going to be there and somebody who, yeah. you know, is a full-bodied white male is going to be there. And so yeah. we recognise that. But sometimes um, I think the systems and... And that's what we're talking about when we're saying racism. It's not just the individuals that maybe attack um, yeah. you as a person, because that yeah. can deal with that's easier to deal with. But when it's systems that are set up yeah. within our, you know, within the NHS, within the police, within um, councils, within bureaucracy, yeah. then that's the bit where we really need allies to support yeah. us. 
to to deal yeah. with all that because that's the that's the racism the structural racism that makes it so much harder for us to to get on and yeah. you know and it's the people who make those kind of aggressive comments in our comment section um they're the ones that are and that um okay that might just be one troll on the internet but it's not because there's five yeah. of him that are working within the different housings and councils yeah. and all of that yeah. stuff that the UK relies so heavily upon yeah and you know and that just made me think of you know black women being five times more likely to die yeah and are being more likely to be born still you know yeah still like born to be still born you know yeah. um and that's a systemic problem that we see all the time um I haven't shared my story <laughs> about my birthing story which was horrific with my last baby but mm -hmm. that really opened my eyes to yeah the systemic racism and how um even after filing a complaint mm -hmm. instead of saying we're gonna investigate they just said we didn't see any of that in our records yeah. like like a racist nurse or midwife is going to yeah. be like okay I was racist to this lady you know exactly. um, you know so that really opened my eyes to the to the systemic um abuse and how it's enabled mm -hmm. um and how yeah like you said that's what we really need allies that's it people to change laws and and to change yeah. how um systems but also just to speak up because if we yeah. see that you know yeah. and my birthing story was similar. I was so in denial, though. I think that's what kept me safe. You know, so for months I had protein in my urine. I had high blood pressure, but none of them were ever addressed during the whole time. And I was I was 28 years of age, but I was incredibly naive about a lot of things, I think, at that point. Um, and so I think it was one day and I was waiting. I was in the waiting room for like four or five hours just for a normal like kind of a checkup. Um mm -hmm. And then eventually I got seen and they were like, oh, your blood pressure's really high. And I was like, yeah, uh, I've been waiting for about three or four hours because I think there was low. And I kept on saying, look, I've not been seen yet. I've not been seen and was just totally ignored and all of that kind of a stuff. And um, eventually I was seen. And I think at one point a senior um, doctor who was an Asian man made the the oh god I can't remember the person the doctor that was dealing with me to come and apologize to me now I like I said at that time was just in total you know and it's not until I look back and reflect back on it that I think that my denial about the what was happening to me at the time um and my you know absolute oblivion to everything yeah. was what kept me safe because I think that if I had recognized that but it doesn't change the fact that I am really traumatized when I go to the GP when I go yeah. to the doctors and stuff like that because I'm like are they going to take this seriously yeah. um is this actually going to be looked at and even today like um I have lupus like I said and so I was at the GP and I was like I'm getting really bad migraines you know and I'm really worried because it's been ongoing for months and months and months and um I was like said so like a scan or whatever has to happen next and I'd also researched that for lupus you should look at a certain thing so I was saying oh and I would like that to happen please yeah. and the GP was like well there's certain criteria and I don't really think that that would be and I was like I'll stop you there <laughs> so I was like I'm not doing this again I'm not getting something that's missed this is not this has been happening for a long time a long period of time I said you know for the longest time last year my blood pressure was so high um, and it wasn't until a pharmacist said, listen, we're just going to do this to increase your blood pressure medication and that'll sort it. And it did. But it's taken a year of constant doctor's appointments for somebody just to make that decision in order for that to be safe. I said, so I'm not having that again. I am not yep. going through this for another year. So this is what I would like to happen, please. And it's got to that point where I'm now going to be considered an aggressive, and you know, the angry black woman. Yeah. purely because of the trauma that we've experienced within the NHS and yeah. not being taken seriously our pains not being considered as oh well that that who'd be a woman then eh I've had that said to me before Do you know things like that that's so 
um, I went in with sore throats and yep. infections in the GP and I was like really heavy bleeding, really um, yep. anemic and things like that. And I was like, look, I feel really weak and blah, blah, blah. And the GP went, oh, could be a woman, eh? And that was another woman GP. <laughs> That's what That was our response. In fact, she told me to stand on the scales first. <laughs> and then, <laughs> this was for a sore throat. And then was like, oh, we bit overweight there, eh? And I was like, yeah, I know. Um, and then I was like, but heavy bleeding, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, who'd be a woman, eh? That was our response. Girl. So I know. What did, you, what did you do? For the longest time, I had, I was just like, whatever. And so I, you know, I would tell my dermatologist um, and the rheumatologist who listened, they were really good at that and would rarely go to the GP. But now, now that I have, like I said, I'm in a new position where I'm 41. Um, I'm challenging that within the workplace. I'm challenging that within myself. Um, yeah. I'm not taking it from the NHS anymore either. But it does need, I need other allies to recognise, actually, wait a minute, this is not okay. And that's the bit where, you know, it's only been from those kindly nurses or a, a GP that's maybe looked at it twice, that it's meant that they have saved their lives to an extent. Yeah. Are you all right? Yeah. I think the hardest thing is when you're be, when you're so vulnerable, when you're yeah. not aware. Yeah. And the people who, sorry, I'm, it just you're makes right. me so upset. People who are some who took a vow, yeah, to, to protect and, and to heal and to help people, mm-hmm. like when they don't check their biases and put our lives in danger, yeah, you know, and like when I was given birth, you know, I honestly I was so unheard, so like just neglected and yeah, and. And they put me in danger. Like he came out yeah. and couldn't. Oh God. And, you know, I was in this labor and it was just horrific. And I just think like, I couldn't imagine doing that to someone else. Yeah. Regardless of what they look like, even my enemy. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. I could, like they're in such a vulnerable state. All they need is good care. Yeah, um, because they are entitled to good care. Yeah, um, no matter what you think they yeah. are, um, and whether you know, and it's just heartbreaking because Not it's us. a to dehumanize us, um, yeah. you know, how you treat us, um, you know how they treat us when at our most vulnerable. It's mm-hmm. saying that we're human enough; we don't deserve the care. Yeah. That they give the you know other uh, people who are not black yeah and it's inhumane it is ungodly it is for me the mo- one of the most disgusting and just wrong thing in this world to see somebody in pain and to just dismiss them to say oh you're just overweight oh oh and, yeah. and you know even someone being overweight why don't you help them if it is a problem right mm-hmm. if overweight is a problem why don't you you know suggest things or you know see whether mm-hmm. they have eating disorder like f- for me for a long time you know I, I you know I I do struggle with an eating disorder and I blamed it on myself I couldn't do it by myself you know now I, mm-hmm. I'm in recovery with, with it and stuff um but people just assume all oh, you know, why don't you just lose weight? Why don't you close your mouth? Or why don't you do this? Um, And it's another way of just thinking that you're superior to someone. If you're in a profession that has taken a vow, chosen to help people, um, why don't you help people rather than just being like, just be your period or you're just overweight, you know, um, you know, give us some suggestions or just listen and and maybe, you know, um, and why you diagnosed with lupus, that time yeah. okay. I have been diagnosed with lupus since 2009 so this is all the things that like the the kind of uh effects or the 
symptoms of lupus. So things like yeah. because you're on immune suppressants and things like that, I've had COVID three times and each time it's absolutely floored me. Constantly yeah. getting infections, bad, you know, teeth, mouth ulcers, yeah. migraines, brain fog, all of that kind of a stuff. Um but certainly since the pandemic um, and stress that's been going on in work and all of that kind of a stuff, which affects my nervous system, which affects the lupus, which means the symptoms are worse. Um, so with all of that, um, that has impacted on my health overall. So yeah. where I am now, even though I'm 41 and technically should be in good health, I feel like I'm falling apart at the seams. And I think a lot of 40 year olds will kind of uh, identify with that as well. Um, but it just feels like it shouldn't life a quality of life should be better than what it is just now um and giving me hundreds of pills that's not what I'm asking for I'm asking for reasons as to yeah. why things are the way they are um and yep you know like even today the GP was like well you know I don't want to feed into any anxieties and things but and I was like look I know what my anxieties are and it's not about you know um I might overthink a symptom for a wee bit, a bit, but my other is the wider society. That's where my focus is at three in the morning, do you know? Um, so, and I'm only doing this because I don't give myself enough time and attention to yeah. actually get the help. I said, so I would like to find out what's happening before I'm getting loads and loads of tablets because I don't want that. Um, and it's like, well, you know, there's going to be waiting. I was like, yep, that's fine. There's going to be waiting lists. There's going to be all of that but I need you to refer me to the relevant people to make sure that everything's getting checked out. And I was like, my cousin has had similar migraines, blah, blah, blah. And they found like an aneurysm, but it's one of those ones where, um, I can't even remember the type of it, but it's not like she doesn't have to get surgery and anything like that straight away. They just have to monitor and do X, Y, and Z. And I was like, do you know what? That's made me think about my health differently. Mm -hmm. And allow, yeah, but just because you're cousins doesn't mean to say they're hereditary linked. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm getting at. I'm getting at that it's made me think about I don't want just a, a pill to kind of a remedy these yeah. things. I want yeah. to find out why. Is it my yeah. lupus or is it something else? And if yeah. it's not something else and it's just my lupus, then we can manage it. But I need to know yeah. for sure. Yeah. Because I'm not um, just taking it anymore. That, yeah, yeah you know, I love that you're able things. to do yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of you know, a lot of people of color, you know, from centuries of being beat down. Um, yeah, we we're not our parents never taught us how to advocate for ourselves, so mm -hmm. they weren't able to advocate for themselves. So then yeah. we find that it's really, really, really difficult to advocate for ourselves. So I love that you're advocating yourself for yourself. Thank you. Now I am. I haven't yeah. always done that. It's, 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 yeah. It's a new revelation. <laughs> In yeah. the last 12 months, I've just suddenly got bolder, less patient, yeah. Yeah. and more determined because I'm like that. Yeah. No, I can't. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. just saying, as I get older, I'm like, no, I need to call things yeah. up. I need to, yeah. so, you know, especially for my kids, I'm just like, mm -hmm. you know, like I was trying to register with the GP because we moved from Belfast to somewhere outside of Belfast. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to register with the GP. Do you know how many times they made me do it? Three times I filled out the same forms. And every time they were like, well, we need proof. We need proof that, you this know, you can access healthcare and I was just like what but I showed you my passport I have an Irish passport um all my kids um you know except one were born here <laughs> given you my husband's passport he is a British citizen like, yeah. like what, so what else do you need oh my god so then I had booked an appointment because one of my kids um wasn't well and I showed up for the appointment and they were like oh we can't see you um because you know you're not really registered I was like we have brought three sets of forms like of the same form because you asked me to and oh my god I couldn't believe it I went crazy I was like it's the angry loud black woman it's I was like what do you mean I've never I surprised myself but it's because it was my child I was like absolutely no, so I was just like you know and she was like well, we can rebook you for an appointment, you know, 
at three o'clock. I was like, well, I have to go now because my husband has to go back to work, you know? And I was just, and they were just like, you try to yourself. And you know what? Somehow we miraculously got registered. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, uh, I was just, how many times do I have to fill in the same form? Literally. It's never about the form. form. It's Every never time. about the form. It's about that kind of a, you're not valid because how, yeah. how have you got an Irish passport? Do you know, it's that questioning, like, well, is this real? No, yeah. it always was fine. It was always valid. So what's the issue? Yeah. I, yeah. I was so confused. And before I realized, because I'm very naive. I Literally, my naivety is only kind of... Yeah. Fake now. It, it just took me a minute. And then when I showed up with a sick child, and you're not going to see me because no. what? Oh, man. I, no, so now exactly. I just, one of my boys they think he might have asthma so I showed up mm-hmm. oh I was at AE a lot last winter the winter just gone mm-hmm. and you know whenever they ask you all these questions I started to ask why yep in the, the past I just gave them answers you know but now I'm like okay why why do you need to know yeah. that you know, and, and then one of them I said because he was being like how many people live at home and what are the names of the people who live at home like all these questions and I'm like do you ask yeah. What, is, so that, what relevance is that? That question. And then they were like, are you involved with a social worker? Um, and I get it. They're trying to protect children and all of that. But I wanted to know, are you asking white people this as well? Or are yeah. you just asking? Yeah. I think if it has just, to be done. Yeah. If you're just asking me, it's not right. But if you're asking everybody else, I'll, I'll answer you. And he yeah. was he looked offended you know Mm -hmm. and I was like he was like why are you asking I was just like because I want to know you know um yeah how relevant is this to the symptoms right now you know trying to stereotype are you trying because I know there's a stereotype of like broken black families and you know all of that Mm -hmm. um you know but that's not even a thing and you know I don't even know is that in Ireland or is that not even in Glasgow, you know, the majority of families and still a lot of that are still really, they're white, you know, and because they're still, we're still the minority of the population. So how does that work? I don't get it. I don't understand. But yet we find ourselves in those situations. Um, But I think it's the way racism and, you know, is passed down. Um, Yeah. so people watch a lot of American shows and then they yes. put they paint us all with the same brush. Um and mm-hmm. but even in America it's a really distorted view mm-hmm. of you know, black people and it's yeah. a way it's another way to to steal their children away. Absolutely. The, you know, mm-hmm. um get me started on America. But I think we've been <laughs> on it for so long. <laughs> we better go. But, you know, before I go, is there anything that you really want to say? Like, um... I think, I think I've said it all, really. I think that we just, we want more allies. We, I want to learn more about, you know, I want to learn more from other Black British people because, um, you know, we have a very different experience to that of America. There's some similarities and things like that, but there is a lot of differences um, in the class system and intersectionality. And, you know, the, the right now in America, the, the power of the church and how that's heavily influenced, but it's really steeped in white supremacy. Um, it's slightly different to here within the UK. So again, all of that, and even black and brown queer experiences is, is useful as well within the UK. So yeah, no, I'm just on a journey to learn more and to share my experiences more too. So I'd be really interested to hear from loads of other people. Yeah. Yeah, I think I you know. Yeah, I think the podcast name will be something along the lines of Black Women in Ireland yeah. and the UK. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Yes, because I want to hear more. I want to hear more from people like you mm-hmm. who are born and bred and your mom is born and bred, you know, so Black mm-hmm. legacy in, in the UK, you know, because yeah. your experience is slightly different from mine, yeah. you know, and um, but uh, yet we have so much in common as well. Yes. And yeah. so I'm so so glad that social media. Yay! I know, so am I. Definitely, I love it. I love it. 
God, it's and just... keep doing all your videos because you just shine through your beauty, your kind words, your tone of voice. It's lovely, Maureen. And do you know what? You know, I'll be in the background just, just in the comments. The <laughs> I'll be in the background. I'll be your bouncer. I'll be your big sister like that. Wait, what are they saying now? <laughs> Uh, yeah oh, honestly, no, I'm so glad yeah. that we're we're connecting and things and you know keep just keep doing you that's it okay, I will I will thank you so much take care thank you take care bye, bye. bye. bye.